Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome back to the channel. Today, as the title suggests, we're getting ready to embark on a very special journey, revisiting one of the most popular series on this channel, Aircraft Dissected, a pursuit to create the most detailed aircraft tutorials for flight simulation on the internet. Make no mistake, this series won't just go into simple code and dark starts or basic point-to-point -point operations. We will be delving into every switch, knob, light bulb, screw, and rivet within the entire Airbus A320 family of aircraft to completely dissect this marvel of engineering and explain how it truly flies. So the next time you fly the fly-by-wire A32NX or the Phoenix A320 or any other Airbus aircraft for that matter, you know exactly what you're doing. What you can learn here can be transcended to the entire A320 family of aircraft, including the A318, A319, A320, as well as the A321, along with their NEO or new engine option variants as well. Now, for the purposes of this instructional guide series, we will be using the Phoenix Simulations A320, but again, as mentioned before, you can transcend your learning from this series into any aircraft in any simulator you fly. So with all that said, ladies and gentlemen, I extend you a very warm invitation to the first episode in what I hope turns into a long-standing series on the channel. Welcome to Aircraft Dissected, the Airbus A320 edition. What is going on guys, Varun from Flyby Simulations here and welcome back to yet another video on the channel. Now a couple housekeeping items before getting started. Number one, I am not a real world pilot, I am a 22 year old business and marketing student with a keen passion for aviation and aerospace, so whatever you guys see in these videos is a product of hours of research, talking to real world pilots, doing my own personal secondary research and so on. Number two, the first few videos in this series will cover all the systems and various subsystems within the Airbus A320, and as such, will be highly educational and theoretical. Once we finish covering this, the final few episodes in this series will cover a full flight from point A to B, covering every procedure, every step, every checklist item and such to teach you how to start an aircraft from cold and dark and bring the aircraft to a turnaround state at the destination aerodrome. And number three, the final point is that these videos do take a lot of effort and time to put together. So if you guys wish to support me and help me to continue make more of these, then please, please subscribe to the channel. Also consider joining our free Discord community if you have any questions about whatever you see in these videos, and also give this video a like to let YouTube know you're enjoying what you're seeing. Additionally, and this is in no way necessary, you can also feel free to join our Patreon page to help support this series financially. Just as an added measure of gratitude for your support, I will also be providing the written text version of these videos for those of you that wish to read this series like a book over on my Patreon page exclusively. Once again, it's completely optional, not necessary whatsoever. The entire aim of this series is to have a free guide available on the Airbus A320 on the internet for those of you that wish to learn about this aircraft. That all being said, let's jump into episode 1 of Aircraft Dissected, the Airbus A320 edition. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the flight deck of the Airbus A320. As you guys can see, the aircraft is completely cold and dark, meaning that all of its systems are turned off with no lights or sounds that can be heard. Now, in this first episode of this series, we will be taking a look at the overhead panel of the flight deck and understand the different systems, switches, lights, and other features housed within it. You might have noticed that the overhead panel itself is divided into two distinct parts. One is towards the back of the flight deck, whereas the other one with more switches and dials is right above the pilots for ease of access. This is done for a reason, as most of the important systems such as the aircraft's air conditioning systems, fuel, hydraulics, and primary electrical systems are all housed within this part of the overhead panel. We differentiate these parts by calling this one the lower overhead panel and this one the upper overhead panel. In the interest of time, we will only be covering the left column of the lower overhead panel in this video, but again, fret not, as we will cover the entirety of both the overhead panels in future videos of this series. The only reason I'm not covering the entire overhead panel in one video is to give more attention to detail to the important subsystems within the aircraft and to also make these videos more structured and manageable in length. So hope you guys can understand that. 
So without further ado then, let's get started with the first system on this column. At the top left here, we have what's known as the ADIRS panel. ADIRS stands for Air Data Inertial Reference System and is probably one of the most important systems within the aircraft. This is because it is responsible for calculating the aircraft's lateral as well as vertical position, its speed, its altitude, attitude, and air data at any given time, and send it to the various displays in the flight deck to assist with the flight management guidance system. Additionally, it also sends this data to various other flight control subsystems within the aircraft. The ADIRS system itself comprises of three identical ADIRUs, which stand for Air Data Inertial Reference Units, which provide three-way telemetry and guidance data throughout the flight in order to be able to plot the exact position of the aircraft in 3D space at any time. Each of these ADIRUs have two components to them, the ADR component as well as the IR component. The ADR stands for Air Data Reference and is responsible for providing information such as the barometric altitude, airspeed, angle of attack, and so on. The IR, on the other hand, which stands for Inertial Reference, is responsible for providing information such as the attitude, the heading, the track that the aircraft is flying, and so on. Unlike the ADR, the IR does not navigate, but simply sends navigational data to the onboard flight management computers for navigational computations. At this time, I would like to point out that if you're a beginner and are feeling too overwhelmed, that is completely normal. You haven't seen these switches in action yet or during flight, but when you do, everything will make perfect sense, so just bear with me here. So now that we've covered the ADIRS system, let's look at the various switches and knobs on this panel, understanding what they do and what purpose they serve. Starting at the top here, we have the main ADIRS system indicator, which shows the status of the ADIRS system at any time. You will normally see an on bat indication here to signify that the ADIRS system is using battery power while calibrating the system before flight. Coming underneath, we have three knobs to control the individual ADIRUs, as well as two sets of three corresponding lights to go alongside with them. Starting with the knobs, pilots would normally turn all three of them to the middle nav position before flight to be able to align the ADIRS system. Above these knobs are the IR component lights which can either show a fault indication or an align indication depending on the state of the specific ADIRU system. A fault obviously indicates a problem with the corresponding ADIRU, and an align light signifies that the specific ADIRU is in the process of calibrating. Similarly, the lights below these knobs are the ADR component switches, which show either a fault indication or an off indication, both of which are again pretty self-explanatory. Congratulations, we now know how the aircraft calibrates its position, but how does it manage to get in these positions and actually move about in the first place? Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the flight control panel. So this panel is a little weird because part of it is here on the left side of the overhead panel and the other half is way on the right side over here. Now, I know I said we'll only be covering this left column of the overhead panel in this video, but for the sake of completeness, we'll cover the flight control panel on both sides to ensure we aren't losing information in the interim. The flight control system within the aircraft is responsible for actually controlling the various physical, movable surfaces on the aircraft, such as the ailerons for rolling, the vertical stabilizers for pitching, and the horizontal stabilizers for yawing the aircraft. The panel itself consists of three different types of systems. Starting from the left, we have the ELAC system, which stands for Elevator Aileron Computers, which, you probably guessed it, controls the movement of the elevators and the ailerons at the aircraft. ELAC-1 on the left side commands the operation of the ailerons, whereas ELAC-2 commands the operations of the elevators. This is simply done for redundancy and backup, since if one of the ELAC system fails, pilots can still use another method to help turn the aircraft. Coming to the right, we have the SEC system, which stands for Spoiler Elevator Computers, and is obviously responsible for controlling the spoilers within the aircraft. There are three systems in this case, SEC-1, SEC-2, and SEC-3, which all have different functions for backup and redundancy. 
Finally, on the right here, we have the FAC system, which stands for Flight Augmentation Computers. This system is primarily responsible for yaw damping movements and subtle course corrections during flight to be able to maintain the right lateral and vertical flight path. If you're coming from a Boeing, this system does the job of a yaw damper, but also has other functions. As with most other systems, there are two FACs, FAC1 on the left and FAC2 on the right. All of these switches act as both lights as well as switches, so no light signifies that these systems are operating normally, and off light obviously signifies that those systems have been manually turned off by the pilots, and a fault light signifies that there is a fault within that specific flight control system. Now what about problems during the flight? As we move further below the flight control panel, we have the emergency evacuation panel, which pilots use to be able to trigger an evacuation in case of an emergency on the ground. Starting from the left here, we have the evacuation command switch, which is a guarded switch that when pushed, sounds an alarm throughout the cabin, alerting the flight attendants to begin the evacuation. This is what the alarm sounds like. To turn off the alarm, simply press the button again and close the guard. Right next to this button, we have the evacuation horn shutoff button, which when pressed, silences the evacuation horn in the flight deck. Keep in mind that the alarm will still play in the rest of the aircraft, but pilots have the option to shut it off in the flight deck itself to concentrate on performing their duties to aid with the evacuation. Finally, on the right, we have another evacuation switch, which has two positions. When switched to this captain and purrs position, the evacuation alarm can be triggered by both the pilots as well as the flight attendants in the cabin. When it is switched to this captain position, the alarm can only be triggered by the pilots in the flight deck. You won't need these switches in a simulator environment mostly, but just some theory for you folks who like the extra bit of detail in your life. Besides, if you're flying the Phoenix A320 and wish to get your entire money's worth with the amount of detail available within this aircraft, you might want to try pushing these buttons from time to time as well. Coming further underneath, we have the Emergency Electrical Control Panel. Now I must preface this section by saying that my knowledge of electronics and electrical components in general is not at the highest level. You know, because I'm a business student, so what you'll learn here is purely coming from research and hours of reading and asking questions to real-world Airbus pilots. I'd love to be corrected in the comment section below, so please let me know if you have any tips or insights. Moving into the panel itself, starting from the left, we have the Emergency Generator Test Switch, which is normally used by ground personnel and maintenance staff to verify normal operation of the electrical buses powered by AC or alternate current. Again, you will never touch this switch even if you are a real-world pilot as it's purely for maintenance purposes. Coming to the right, we have this Generator 1 line switch which shows the status of Generator 1 by either showing an off light or a smoke light. An off light obviously signifies that the line connecting Generator 1 has been manually turned off. The smoke light on the other hand illuminates when smoke has been detected within the avionics ventilation system, which is the complex array of wires and electrical circuits that make up the overall electrical and flight management system within the aircraft. In the event that smoke is detected, the aircraft must be placed in the smoke configuration to ensure safety of other flight components. Again, this is an emergency system and is normally never used in day-to-day -day flight operations. Coming further right, we have the RAT and Emergency Generator Manual on switch. Now the RAT and the Emergency Generator are actually two different components that work in conjunction to provide power in case of a dual engine failure or complete power loss in the aircraft mid-flight. So let's start with the RAT, which stands for Ram Air Turbine. It's a little fan-like contraption that extends down from the belly of the aircraft. The incoming air will spin this RAT, which acts as a sort of mini windmill to be able to aid in producing electrical power for basic aircraft operations. The emergency generator is connected to this RAT and is responsible for taking the kinetic energy of the turbine and turning it into useful electrical energy to be able to perform an emergency landing using important subsystems. So starting with this indication light over here, the fault light illuminates when there's obviously a fault with either the RAT or the emergency generator or both. The red guarded switch right next to it is normally in the auto configuration, where the RAT will automatically deploy in case of power loss during an emergency. 
If in some situation, however, the rat doesn't deploy automatically or the emergency generator doesn't kick in, pilots can push this button in to be able to manually aid the process. I hope that made sense. If there are any real world Airbus A320 pilots in the comments section below, once again, please do let me know if my explanation was accurate or whether you might have some further insights to help explain these subsystems better. All right, so coming further underneath, we have the EGPWS control panel, which stands for Enhanced Ground Proximity Warning System and is responsible for enunciating various sounds within the cockpit depending on the phase of flight. These sounds include everything from the minimums callout when the aircraft is descending towards the runway, all the way to terrain warnings and other such auditory caution messages. On the panel itself, we have five different GPWS inhibit switches, which basically allow pilots to silence certain GPWS callouts during specific circumstances. So let's start from the left and work our way to the right. On the left, we have the terrain switch, which when switched off, inhibits all terrain caution messages. When no light is illuminated, that signifies that the terrain callouts are active and will sound wherever applicable. Finally, we also have a fault light which obviously indicates a fault with the terrain mapping and enunciating system. To the right of this switch, we have the system switch which also has three modes, on, off and fault. This switch is sort of like the master GPWS switch, so when no light is illuminated, the system is working as intended. When the switch is turned off, the entire GPWS system is inhibited and a fault light obviously indicates a fault with the entire GPWS system. The next three switches don't have fault lights and are simply just on off switches. So we have the GS mode switch right here which pertains to glide slope callouts during descent and landing. Right next to it we have the flap mode switch which when switched off silences automated warnings such as too low, flaps and other such callouts which can be of nuisance to pilots who have planned and anticipated for a lower flap landing. Finally, here we have the landing flap 3 switch, which pilots select when landing at airports typically at higher altitudes. Unlike the Boeing 737 where pilots can choose between flap 30 and flap 40 for a regular landing, one normally always lands with a config full or full flap configuration and an Airbus A320. Hence, pilots will normally turn this switch off whenever they decide to perform a config 3 or flap 3 landing and don't want to be bothered by annoying voice callouts during the approach that they're already aware of. Alright ladies and gentlemen, we're almost done with the left side of the overhead panel. Just a few more systems left. So coming underneath, we have the recorder panel, which consists of the CVR or cockpit voice recorder as well as the DFDR or digital flight data recorder. All of these systems are part of the colloquially used black box system, which allows air crash investigators to be able to uncover pilot communications as well as other flight related actions performed by the pilots moment before a crash. Both the CVR and DFDR become automatically operational for 5 minutes after electrical power has been established and then turn off. They then turn on when either of the engines are started and remain running until 5 minutes after the last engine has been shut down. As for the switches themselves, we first have the ground control switch here, which allows pilots to turn on both the recorders manually outside of the normal operation times and is normally used to be able to test the recording systems. Coming to the right of this switch, we have the CVR Erase button, which allows pilots to manually erase all previously recorded voice communications since the beginning of that particular flight. In order to do this, pilots must press the button and hold it for 2 seconds and also make sure that the aircraft is on the ground with the parking brake set. To the right of this button, we have the CVR test button, which allows pilots to test the CVR system by means of a low frequency tone that is sounded throughout the flight deck, signifying that the system is operating nominally. Moving below the recorder panel, we have the ever important oxygen panel, which houses all the primary passenger and crew oxygen systems within the aircraft. So starting from the left, we have the oxygen mask manual on switch. The switch is normally set to the auto position, meaning that the oxygen masks back in the cabin would automatically deploy as soon as the cabin altitude exceeds 14,000 feet. 
A more detailed explanation of cabin depressurization and lack of oxygen can be found in my 737 aircraft dissected video in the card on the top right hand corner of the screen. Of course, the entire playlist with 16 episodes covering the 737 is linked down in the description section of the video for your viewing pleasure as well. If there's a fault within the oxygen system and the oxygen masks don't deploy automatically, then pilots can flip open this guard and press this switch to deploy them manually. Right next to the switch, we have the passenger oxygen system on light. This light illuminates with a system on indication every time the oxygen mask doors above the passenger seats are actuated and are providing oxygen when the masks have been deployed. Right next to the passenger oxygen on light, we have the oxygen crew supply switch. Similar to the passenger oxygen system light, the crew supply switch also illuminates an off light, signifying when the supply of low pressure oxygen has been restricted to the specialized oxygen masks located in the flight deck for pilots to use. However, unlike the previous light, the oxygen crew supply switch also acts as a button and allows pilots to manually turn on the flow of oxygen to their oxygen masks in case of a rapid or gradual drop in cabin pressure. Obviously a very important system indeed. Moving swiftly along then, we come to the penultimate system on this side of the overhead panel. Allow me to introduce you to the calls panel, which essentially allows pilots to grab the attention of flight attendants in the cabin through that iconic chime sound you might have heard in the cabin as a passenger. Once again, starting from the left, the mech button when push initiates a call to ground personnel through an audio output device located near the front of the nose landing gear. Pilots can use this button to directly communicate with ground personnel during ground operations. Moving to the right, we have a forward and aft call switch, both of which produce a chime as well as a pink light in the corresponding area of the cabin to grab the flight attendant's attention. Lastly, on this panel, we have the emergency call switch, which sounds a chime in both the forward and aft cabin and also sends an emergency call message on all flight attendant panels. As you can probably expect, this button is also rarely used, and when it is, it's normally to perform non-normal operations within the aircraft. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the windshield wiper panel, where there is one button and one switch left to cover. So this little switch here is the rain repellent switch. In the real aircraft, the rain repellent is inhibited, meaning it does not work when the aircraft is on the ground with the engines turned off. However, during flight, if the button is pushed, a timer is activated which applies a measured quantity of rain repellent fluid on the applicable windshield. Right next to the rain repellent button, we have a windscreen wiper switch which obviously controls the windscreen wiper in front of the windshield. You can cycle this between the off, slow, and fast modes depending on the intensity of the precipitation being encountered, just like you would do in a car. Similar to the flight control panel, both the button and the switch on the left side can also be found on the right side to control the first officer's windshield. And that's that for the left side of the lower overhead panel. And with that ladies and gentlemen, we come to the conclusion of our very first episode in this aircraft dissected series covering the Airbus A320. Now I know some of you longtime Flyby Simulations viewers might have noticed that you have actually seen this series started on the channel before and that a lot of what's mentioned here has been mentioned in a previous video. However, those among you with a keen eye might have also noticed that I've made several changes and improvements to the video incorporating new methodologies to suit my current style of content. That being said, in the next video, we'll be covering the central column of the overhead panel, covering important systems such as the fuel, hydraulics, fire protection, and more. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like, subscribing to the channel, and hitting the bell icon to be notified of future videos in this series. Additionally, if you have any further questions, please do join our free Discord server and I'll be happy to help you guys out there as well. With that all said, thanks for watching and thanks for flying by.